We live in a constantly changing world where the speed of information is changing how we think and act and connect with one another. When people in a society lose faith in their institutions, in God and in each other, the nation collapses. We need help rebuilding trust and tying it all together. Welcome to All That To Say, a podcast exploring the interrelatedness of all things in long-form conversation. Author, speaker, and founder of New Life Ministries, Stephen Arterburn, joins the podcast for fearless conversation about sexuality, brokenness, and the transforming power of grace. Welcome to All That to Say, and I am so, so thrilled to have with me, and thrill's a big word, but I am thrilled to be in the company of Stephen Arterburn. Stephen, thanks for joining us. Thanks, Jim. Always like coming up here. It's uh, where I, right near where I get my CPAP machine fixed, so uh, yeah, it's always worth it to come up. <laughs> and right, right here from the get-go, <laughs> this is why I'm thrilled, is because Steve Arterburn is a good time. No matter what <laughs> context, I'm telling you, I've known you for a few years mm. now, and I never walk away. Uh, without smiling, without laughing, without feeling better about, you know, life is good and it can be good for all of its broken places. Mm -hmm. Steve, you have a gift of pulling things together in such a way that leaves people better. That's Mm. no small thing. Thank you. That's no small thing. And I, I fully expect anyone that is watching or listening to us today on all that to say is going to be better uh, by the end before they were at the beginning. And let me tell you why I love that word. You know, um, when this magazine company was looking for a word that would best describe what they wanted to do, they did the research and they came up with the best word that would appeal to the most people. Better homes and garden. That's what it wasn't perfect homes. It wasn't, you know, resilient home. It was better. And really, if, if you just put one day on top of another, and each one of them is better than the previous day, You, your life's going to be pretty good. So and, I love that word better. I mean, it's great insight because honestly, that sounds so doable, doesn't mm-hmm. it? Oh, it does. I may not be perfect tomorrow, no. but I could be better. Yep. And that makes it accessible. And maybe, Steve, that's part of what God has given you, the capacity to help remind people of that, that life is a journey and you can get better. Mm-hmm. You don't have to stay where you are and you don't have to go backward. And there is a destination that's worth walking toward. Can I jump in and tell you how much better it can get? My um, oldest brother is gay and married a woman, had four children, um, great children. And when the last one graduated from college, he said to his wife and kids, I am gay and I am leaving you and I'm going to go live with Nathan. And it just ripped our family apart. And my mother uh, was in such despair because my middle brother had also been gay and died of AIDS very early on in the epidemic. And I remember about 10 years ago, my mother finally asking or allowing his partner to come to Thanksgiving lunch or dinner Um and then leave. And I thought that was so amazing that she could do that. There was no question whether or not she, she wasn't approving. She wasn't endorsing. No, change her ideas about it. No. And just, um, about a week ago, I talked to my mom and she said, Terry, my older brother is going to come pick me up and take me to Christmas with all his kids. And I said to him, rather than drive me back, which is a 90 mile drive, I've never seen your home. I guess you have another bedroom. How about I come spend the night with you rather than you drive me home? Now, for my mother to do that, after all these years, she's never been in his home, that shows that she is willing to grow and try to make their relationship better. There's no issue. He has no question about what a a, a meaningful thing that is, and what she had to go through to come to that point. She's 94, and if she can do that at 94, we can do some things to make our relationships 
better. And I think so often we get so caught up in, well, I don't want to give this impression or that impression. And I can guarantee you, if that's your biggest worry, you don't need to worry about your impression. I think people are probably... <laughs> They've already sized you they, up. <laughs> they, they are quite aware of that. But my whole point is she still, to this day, is looking at how she can make the lives of other people better. And that's that's been my model to have her. And of course, my father was the same way before he died. But anyway, that's what well, comes up when you I say mean, better. Okay, so you, well, you've just opened up a big doorway there. Mm. Unpack that for us since you brought your family into the, yeah. uh, the conversation and that journey uh, in a world where uh, my assumption is based on your comment that your mother was not someone who would ordinarily have uh, wanted to be in the company of someone who was gay. Right. And, and certainly didn't want to see her son right. uh, travel down that road. No. And, and that whole journey you've described now of a period of years, you're saying that it's better now because your mom has come to a more, um, how would you describe it? A, a more engaged position. She's more uh, caring about the person or interested in the developing the relationship than she is creating a wall to prove a point. Is that, is that how you're reading yeah, it? I, I would, I would say that she is expanding her ways of loving him, not giving up any principle or theological belief. None of that has changed. But in that expansion of how could I love him better, I'm going to go see his home, and I'm going to spend the night there. And that's all that that is. And we, you know, I would, in my home, I would never let anybody that wasn't married uh, spend the night in the same bedroom. I don't care what gender you are. And she's the same way, but this isn't her home. It's his, and she's willing. And she's respecting that. Yeah, and she's and, never invited them to stay in her home and stay in the same bedroom. But uh, So some people might say, well, she should go that far too. Well, you can think that, but I think this is a bold move on her part. And having been with two brothers, um, I really, if you look at the stereotypical gay profile that people talk about, I was the musician. I sang. I was the writer. I wrote. I didn't like football, and I lived in Texas. And I think if you, you know, I was an artist. I loved art. If you looked at them and me, you'd say, well, this is the child that's going to grow up gay. But there was a difference between their experience and mine. Both of them were molested by our pastor's son. Both of them when they were five. By the time I was five, we had already left that town. Or I might have been the next victim. Now, some people say, well, not every person that's gay is molested. No, that's true. But I'm just telling you, both of them will tell you that that started something, ignited something. My brother, my middle brother who died from AIDS, had no sexual experience between that molestation until he was 26 years old. And... um so I, I've been through this with both of them from different perspectives. I wrote a book for my middle brother. Uh, my theology hasn't changed at all. My understanding of them has changed over the years, and my understanding of my mother has changed too. So I think anytime we have a simple answer, simple perspective to complex issues like this, we really need to Take a second look, because it isn't quite that simple. Wow. So what would you say your theology is? Well, I do think that God created man and woman to be married, and that sex is intended between a man and a woman to be married. Now, I've just lost some people who think, well, that's just so old-fashioned or whatever. Well, it's not really old-fashioned. I really believe that uh, to be true. And I think there are some things that get in the way of that. Um, years ago, I read a, a book uh, called The Sissy Boy Syndrome. It was by a secular psychiatrist. And he, he said, you know, the, the ex-Marine dad sees his little boy playing with a doll. And he walks up to him and he picks up the doll and says, boys don't play with dolls and throws the doll away. And this guy said, you know, if that dad had picked up the boy rather than the doll, 
and loved him. No matter what happened, there would have been a bond of love in that relationship that would be so much healthier than telling someone, you can't do this. So when people are hateful, but they say, well, we hate the sin and love the sinner, but they're really hateful to the sinner. Uh, that is that I try to avoid that in every case. I think that in this day and age, and I have a 12 year old and a 15 year old, uh, the internet provides you with content that is going to tell you whatever you feel like doing is okay. And then there's not just content. But if you have some kind of contact with somebody that's arousing, that content will tell you arousal is related to identity. And arousal isn't necessarily related to identity. Um, a lot of things are arousing. And an incestuous relationship can be arousing. But that doesn't mean that that is okay. And so you add content, you add uh, the contact, and then this connection that develops. There, there are, there's a community that you're a part of. I think all of that feeds into um, a person believing, this is the way I am, I have no choice, I have to go this direction. And I, I don't think it's as um, simple as, well, if you are aroused by uh, someone of the same gender, um, you just decide not to be. It's not that simple. Um, but I do believe that there are people that are very happy being celibate, and I think there are people miserable being celibate. I think there are people miserable, uh, heterosexuals, all the, all the things are there. And I think maybe the only progress that we've uh, started to have as a large body is maybe we're starting to say this isn't a sin that's worse than this adulterous pastor up there shaming everybody. I, th I think we've made some progress in that area without saying, like the internet does, social media does, anything you feel, that's who you are, you should go with it, just live like you want to live. That is not my position. To be fair, to say, you know, all of us uh, have a challenge sexually. Absolutely. Everyone does. Yes. The continuum is vast. Yes. But somewhere on that continuum, every person has to wrestle to the ground some things about their sexuality. This great gift of God yeah. that can be uh, taken in so many different directions. And uh, I'm hearing you say that your predicate is that there is there is a healthy way or a better way to experience our sexuality within a certain parameter that uh, is unpacked in Scripture or is understood in an orthodox interpretation of Scripture. Well, I have to tell you, uh, this has gotten me in trouble because people don't hear the whole context, but I would say to people that my middle brother who died from AIDS was more moral than me. He didn't go around and have sex with a lot of people. And I did, and I got one pregnant and paid for the abortion. And, and so um, I, I've always felt like, no, I wasn't gay, but I was uh, so on the other side of immoral and promiscuous, and I paid a huge price, and other people were hurt by that, uh, that I get it that that particular area of sin is part of sexual brokenness, just like my sin was part of sexual brokenness, too. And we all have... We all have stuff, don't we? We do. We and do. I guess maybe to back to the beginning of your illustration with your mom and uh, her son. Yeah. It's better to have a relationship that's respectful and loving yeah. in the way that I understand you are here and I may be in a different place in my own thinking, but I can still love you, my son. Absolutely. And I want to see your home and I want to be in the mix of your life. Uh, that that's a better place to be right. than just, uh, I don't agree with you about this, and therefore uh, a wall is constructed. Well, and I think because uh, it's difficult for many of us to have relationships, and it's difficult to have relationships with your kids, a lot of people use something as the excuse to have nothing to do with them again. 
And uh, I, I just don't think that is, uh, you're going to find Jesus being like that, well, with anybody other than Christian leaders who were uh, more interested in their cute hats and robes than they were the people that they were supposed to serve. You know, we've dived in a very short time yeah. into some pretty deep water here, yeah. Steve, because you wrestled with deep water. Hmm. Your life has uh, been framed in a way by helping people understand the deep water of their own journey. And your own is, 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 is your own experience informs the way in which you have landed. Uh, for our audience today, it's just important to note that you are a very powerful and influential voice. You have sold, uh, Millions of books. There are 15 million of your books hmm. in print. Yeah. That is a phenomenal number. People think about a bestseller. A bestseller is something that might be hmm. in a few thousands. Yeah. Uh, you have millions of books in print. You have been a media presence on air and online. You have been on the stage. You have helped craft things like Women of Faith, where five million yeah. paying participants Makes no uh, sense. <laughs> stood, you know, came to this, the vast arenas. Uh, you have spoken on television. You've been with Oprah on TV. You've been at Good Morning America. You have uh, been interviewed by magazines from Rolling Stone or yeah. media outlets to the New York Times. I mean, there is so much reach for your voice, but it's always about life. Yeah. You're, you're not talking about other subjects of interest. To, you know, we could, there are people who talk about sports or science or yeah. business, but that's not you. You're talking about Life. Yeah. In fact, you have a signature broadcast called New Life. Right. Live. How many years on air? Well, we just went through our 34th birthday as an organization. And I think our broadcast is, uh, well, I think it's about 30 years old. I, I really should look into history well, more. <laughs> it's <laughs> something like that. It, it has legs yeah, and it, it has proved its merit and worth right. because people are still listening. They're still calling in. It's a show where you can call in. Right. And out of that new life, a whole other uh, collection of ministries and helps are provided with retreats yeah. for married couples or for men or just for women. Or I mean, Steve, you might be called a polymath. Yeah. Someone who I know what that means, actually. <laughs> <laughs> someone, someone who has so many disciplines of knowledge that you take big ideas and you weave them together and you're able to kind of make sense of things. Not everyone can do that. You do that so well. Thank and, you. And when you think about all those things, I've just kind of, I've just scratched the surface. I'm just, uh, when you think about all that, what is for you the golden thread or the, the idea or the, the passion mm -hmm. that has led you to be that voice about life? Well, I was so broken. In college, you know, I was on uh, antidepressants in my freshman year, and I was so uh, lost. I mean, I, I was a believer from age nine, but I was so out there. Um, and I, I heard someone give me some advice that I took, and it was to go make it right with everybody I had hurt. And... Until then, I couldn't. It was hard for me to look people in the eye. I had so much shame, and I kind of felt like, like on the abortion thing, that it was my job to show God no one had ever felt worse about that than me. And I literally made a list of the people I had hurt, and I called, wrote, or saw them, and asked for their forgiveness. And that turned my life around. I was already a believer, but I didn't know how to get out of this rut. And somebody said, here's how you get free. And every one of those conversations, there was something so redemptive about it. So then I got counseling, and then I studied counseling. I was actually a chief therapist in an alcohol and drug treatment center in Fort Worth while I was going to seminary. I just became fascinated with my own life that God could, I could go from this burden of shame to freedom. And I wanted other people to have that. And so... I have never been confused about what my life was about. It was trying to help people not feel better, but to transform their lives. And so everything, when we started New Life in 1988, here were our, our things. Truth, true truth, the way God meant it, and redemptive relationships, 
and transformation. We wanted to see people that were headed that way go the other way. And we're still doing that today. And uh, in many ways, we're just getting started. When you said that you went to college and you were depressed, even as a freshman, yeah. uh, do you believe that depression was consequent to your sense of shame or this kind of guilt burden you carried? Or is it unrelated to that? How would you speak to depression these days? Yeah, I, I think there were a couple of things that were really serious. One, um, I had a, an amazing high school girlfriend. And I lost that relationship. I, um, I destroyed that relationship. And there was um, no one that I could really talk to about that. And, and there wasn't a grieving process that I could go through. And it was very much like losing a person that, uh, you know, you, you were married to or something mm-hmm. at that age. So I think that really fed into it. And then I think uh, the other piece was I, I drank too much. Uh, I uh, did everything I could to numb my feelings or feel something different. And when I wasn't doing some of those things, then I was depressed. And I was always looking for the next way to alter my mood. Um, I'll just say, and a tangential thing was that I was, I had attention deficit disorder and I wasn't treated for that. And the frustration from that also was a big part of my depressing life. So when I heard some people talking about attention deficit disorder back then, uh, and the, I, it, it made my life, uh, I mean, the lights came on. I saw some reasons that thing and things that happened, and it was such a source of hope. So I just have loved watching people get better. And when I worked with alcoholics, I saw people that looked like they were going to die, and 30 days later, they had pulled things so much together. And what they did after that, you know, that I, you didn't know, but in treatment, they really, really were able to make some big changes. Very fulfilling for you. Oh, to, so fulfilling. To just to walk alongside and to be a voice in it. Oh, and, and you know, when we started New Life, I, I had a, we had 88 beds in a hospital in Anaheim, California, and a partnership with Robert Schuler and the Hour of Power. And you would see me come on at the end and say, if you need some help, call us. And it was, it was just amazing to get to work with the toughest folks. And... Probably uh, 10 years ago, a woman found me and said, I was in your psychiatric hospital in Anaheim. I was about to abort my child, and I didn't because of the influence your team had on me. I had a son. He became an Eagle Scout. At, at one of the scouting camps, a boy was drowning, and my son swam out to save him. My son drowned, but the other boy was saved. And he said, she said, you know, you gave me 15 years that I would have never had with that boy. I mean, those kind of stories, how do you not (laughs) just uh, thank God every day that you had, you were able to have some kind of influence and, and that a mother wasn't, who was already in, in trouble. She had been in psychiatric care 15 years prior, but she wasn't giving up. She wasn't angry at God. She had worked through it and wanted to tell me that story. You have not been shy about talking about this abortion in which yeah. you participated long ago. You Pressured con- the girl to have you, it. You conceived a child out of wedlock, did, yeah. so to speak. Wedlock sounds like an old-fashioned <laughs> word these does. days, doesn't it? But, yeah. but with a woman to whom you were not married and she got pregnant, and your testimony is you pressured her into an abortion, meaning that was not necessarily her first choice, but she felt pressure from you. She said she wanted to have our baby, but I told her I would not be there for her or for our baby, and that she needed to do this. And so we did it. How old were you then? I was uh, 19. And and that, that's that been a very important piece of your history. I mean, I've I've heard you reference this at times because as time marched on, as your life moved on. Yeah. It's it haunted you. It did. Yeah. And tell me about that. What what you about abortion because abortion is much on the stage of public uh, debate right now. Well, you know, no one can create life and you look at the billions and billions of light years of space out there and we've spent millions of dollars trying to 
hear a bleep or something. We've sent spacecraft out there looking for intelligent life, and and there's no life out there. I mean, we're it seems that we're it, and I mean, it's so rare in the universe life. Every time someone's born or is conceived, we ought to be, you know, celebrating. Oh my goodness, it's happened in this vast billions of light years of universe. It's happened again. A life has been conceived. And so it's such a special thing. And when you take a life, but you take the life of your own child and you, you realize that there, there would have been a child and this child would have had children and, and you see what, what it's, you've done. It's just overwhelming when you realize how bad that is. Or, and I felt so bad about it. And, you know, you, uh, I, I really viewed myself as a, a murderer of, of my child. And, and so... But did anyone ever say to you or did you think, well, it, it wasn't a fully developed life or it wasn't really a life yet or it was a group of cells or, you know, that whole argument about viability and when does life begin... Did, did you ever, were you drawn into that side of the Never. debate? I, Never. I heard just, people say stuff like that, but I knew. But you felt, you knew yeah. this yeah. was a life from right. the and, moment of conception. And back then there weren't a lot of uh, women's resource centers with billboards and stuff. And and so the only break I can give myself is there weren't a lot of places being advertised, call this number if this mm-hmm. happens to you. And I just did what... Um, I thought you did in these situations. I knew it wasn't right, but I didn't know how wrong it was until about three days afterwards. And that's when it really hit me. And so I did. I just, I lived in this shame. I developed ulcerative colitis over this guilt and shame. And a physician said, if, if something in your life doesn't change, they're going to kill you. These are, I can't fix this for you. You have to do something. And, um, when I realized that God's grace was big enough for that, and I remember Chuck Swindoll saying, you know, in God's eyes, your past ended one second ago. Why would you live in it? And talked about the grace that God had. Um, and that's why he had to go to the cross for really crummy stuff like this. I began to live differently. And I made things right with folks, but it became a mission. And so now um, most of my speaking is in women's resource centers and pregnancy centers and raising money for them. It just became part of my life to help people see that there is an impact. And all through my life, I've looked in secular magazines and publications, and I've seen atheists talk about the impact. These are men. Talk about that they didn't fully get over that, that they still, every year at some time or another, this trigger happens. And I just think there's this intrinsic guilt over destroying a life that even an atheist is going to experience. The other side of this is that anyone that's listening to this and and this feeling and struggling with this, uh, there's so much love and grace from God who understands this. And one of the biggest supporters of New Life heard me talk about this on a broadcast. And then I wrote this book, The God of Second Chances, and she read it and it changed her life. She said, I finally was able to forgive myself for that. And uh, just one of the most incredible people ever. And so I want other people to know that, well, it isn't right, but it's not beyond God's grace. And you can live free of that kind of guilt and shame if you'll just accept Christ's sacrifice as the penalty. So interesting, you said that you didn't comprehend the magnitude of what you had facilitated and right. required in a way until three days later. Yeah. That's pretty immediate after. Yeah. I mean, well, uh, it just, it, it just, just came upon you. What well, have I done? You know, in one moment, I'm, oh, we got to, we got to fix this. We got to take care of this. We got to get, these consequences out of the way. And then once it was done and that agenda had died, then it began to and really seep in. Oh my gosh. And the mother of that child? I spoke with her um, years later. I asked her 
forgiveness. She was on your list. She was. But then a few years after that, I was asked to speak at Baylor Chapel, and I told the story about it, and I received a phone call from her a few days later, and she said, I heard that you told our story at Baylor Chapel. And I said, yes, I I didn't, I think I, I told it in a way no one would know that this was you or put it together. And she said, oh, I know. She said, but the next time you tell it, you should be more honest. And I said, well, what do you mean, be more honest? And she said, well, you didn't just pay for the abortion, which is what I had said. I had paid. She said, uh, you didn't just pay for it. You pressured me. And that's when I learned and didn't until that time really fully realize. She said, I wanted this baby, and I wanted to raise your baby, and I wanted us to raise the child. But the pressure you put on me, I felt I had no choice but to do what you wanted me to do. And that was really tough to hear that. Yes, yes. And so there was a whole other... A whole uh, other kind of repentance yeah, of that. Yeah, that's right. So um, she uh, has a, a wonderful life, has children, and uh, has a miracle baby. That, you know, and, you know, and here I got married, and, and we were infertile for seven years. And, of course, Christian said, I think you're infertile because you paid for the abortion and stuff. But that, that isn't true. And then... A couple that didn't have an abortion uh, in 1990, they decided that we would be the parents of their baby. And so on Christmas Eve, Madeline was born, who is now 30 years old and one of the just most amazing people in the world. She, she's an occupational therapist. She married an occupational therapist. She's on three soccer teams, one semi-professional. But people call me all the time. I was just with your daughter. She is such an incredible human being. So God gave back to me what I had destroyed. That's the God of grace that we have. And it's not the, I'm going to punish you for the rest of your life. And if you are infertile thinking it's related to abortion, I got to tell you, that's, that's not the God that I know. God literally wipes the slate clean, white as snow. It's pretty hard to argue with white as snow. So... Um, you either accept that or you live a life that God doesn't want you to live. I just have to reflect that uh, this whole conversation always resonates deeply with me because as you know, and you've known me, I'm an adopted person. I didn't meet my mother, my birth mother, until I was 58 years old. Um, We had a face-to-face meeting. She was a lovely person. She had talked to me on the phone before that, but I'd never seen her, met her, and she'd never seen me. In that conversation, to my surprise, she described the journey towards my birth, and she was unmarried and so on. And uh, she was was from a small Irish village where they were very conservatively framed, and she was terrified that anyone in the village would, would discover she was with child and not married, because in the context of the place and time, she felt like her whole family would be ostracized. And Mm -hmm. she carried a burden not just for herself, but the impact it was going to have on her larger family. So she wasn't sure what to do. She didn't tell anyone. She didn't just, she didn't, she didn't tell the father of the baby. He did not know Mm. uh, until he met me uh, decades on. And then uh, she did def- confide in one person who was her aunt, and her aunt did not have any children, had kind of doted on her, and she felt like that was a safe place. The aunt built a bridge for her to a physician, a woman physician. And that woman, according to my birth mother, whose name was Maureen, sat her down and said, you're a lovely young Irish gal. My mother was at that time 22 years old. You're a lovely young Irish gal. I can abort this baby. Mm. And you can go on and no one will ever know. I was just listening to her because she's describing me. I had no idea of what the particulars were. And she looked at me and she said, I was terrified and I didn't know what I was going to do, but I knew what I would not do. Mm. And I, I could not end your life. Mm. And I just remember looking at her thinking, wow, uh, Thanks for that. (laughs) It sounds so kind of, I don't know, elementary, but I think about my life. It's so profound. And 
and everything I've experienced. And yes, I've messed a few things up and a few other people have probably, but I also, I have four sons and I have seven grandchildren. And, uh, and there are some people would say the world's a bit better because I walked by it. There's just so much at stake in the, in the debate that is often zeroed in on just the moment. Well, you know, but I, I have to say to my birth mother, it wasn't easy. No, She found herself alone. She spoke the Irish language. She did not learn English until she was an adult because she came from a, a part of Ireland where uh, the Irish language was the first language. And right. what I'm saying is that's, that you, it's hard to go anywhere with just the Irish language in 1952. Yeah. And, and she's, she had to build her life, but I look back on it, and she, at my 58 years on, she looks at me, and she had never, and here's that, she relinquished me, mm -hmm. got married to another guy, and never told him, she never told anyone, and never was able to have another child. Wow. But she looks at me, and she said, I did the right thing. Absolutely. Jim, your story is so reflective of what I tell a lot of people. There are people listening right now that are angry that they were given up for adoption. And I just got to tell you, just like in your case, your mother was your hero. And a lot of people are angry at someone who literally is their hero, that they brought them into this world, could not, for whatever reason, take care of them. But, oh my goodness, I love your story because it is such an intimate glimpse in the heart of a hero that let you be you, and I get to do radio or <laughs> podcast well, well, with you. It's awesome. Maybe, maybe the reality is, though, a lot of adoptions are are mess ups too, and some children are adopted by abusive adoptive parents, and I mean there are all kinds of dramas with it. Yes. But maybe the bottom line, the thread here, and this is what I would uh, trace back to Steve Arterburn, is that in the end, life is itself the most precious commodity. Amen. And whatever station or circumstance of your life, it can get better. Yeah. If you make choices. And, you know, as a, as a small child, I may not be able to change my circumstance, but sooner or later, I will start making choices for myself that can influence the course of my life and it can be better. I mean, that's really what Steve Arterbring seems to me. That's what you bring to the table in every mm -hmm. conversation. And that is so sadly too rare in our time. Well, one of the great gifts you gave me was to be able to do the Healing is a Choice mm -hmm. series at your church. And it I still, it's just was some of the best time ever because that congregation was so receptive. But it really is a choice that a lot of people don't want to make or think they can or have it. And they stay in some state less than a healed state because they're not making some really wonderful choices that are hard, like to forgive or to grieve or to embrace reality. But when we start going that that route, I mean, the world opens up to us. And, you know, the least effective predictor of success is motivation. Uh, you can have awareness and you can be motivated to change what, what it, you're aware of. But if you don't have willingness, motivation desire. It's worthless. And so I would think my biggest um, gift to the world is just to say, evaluate. Are you willing as a husband, wife, father, child, are you willing for things to be better? If you're not, then you're going to live a life that's much less than it has to be. Willingness, that separates the folks that get better from those that don't. You've written a lot of books. Healing is a choice is one of those. And as you reflected on that, I remember uh, those days well. I mean, it's a, it's a great book that walks us through, uh, through a biblical lens, a New Testament lens, a, a, a Jesus journey lens about how we have choices to make and how we can make the right choices and, and, the, and the outcomes that that can lead to. You've written so many books, though. I mean, some, like Every Man's Battle, have become almost iconic books, uh, with, I think, three or four million copies sold of that one mm -hmm. title itself. But when you look back on all these books, and I should say also, you, you started to, in recent times, you've delved into children's literature. Yeah. Uh, with uh, Marcus Brotherton and I did um, um, this 
little book on theology of a 12-year-old, you know, telling Bible stories, and, and we, we won an award for it. it I mean, it's, it's the stroke of genius, really. When you look at all that, that archive, that catalog, what stands out in your mind is like, man, this is, this is the book uh, you need to read. In other to words, Toxic Faith. Toxic Faith. That's the one for you that stands out mm -hmm. today. Yeah. Tell me about Toxic Faith. Well, when I wrote it with Jack Felton, uh, it was on the cover of Publishers Weekly, and they reviewed it and said it was an instant classic. And over the years, I've had many people say they were about to give up on Jesus because of this sick church that they were in, and they someone handed them that book uh, because it outlines these characteristics of a church where you know the leadership is is uh, in trouble, uh, the theology is off, people are playing these different roles, and I honor the one role in a toxic faith system, the role of outcast, because all these people that come to me, they're outcasts. And it's just been a really uh, rewarding book to have worked with Jack Felton on, and it just describes what happens in churches when power, fame, and incompetence, um, and folks that are addicted to being close to power when they all are let loose. So I, I really love that book probably more than any. Give me, give me some ideas out of the book. What are the signatures that someone could identify in their local context? Well, um, I, first of all, it would be... Um, unbiblical control of a person's life. Elders telling people uh, who can be married and who can't, who could, should divorce, who should live, you know, those kinds of things. There's even an example of a, a man who told his congregation, this is the toothpaste you must use because this one is of Satan, you know, just things like that. But when you see folks wanting more control and power over individual lives, um, it's, it's really cultish in that congregation. When you see the, the church serving the ego or the persona of the pastor versus him committed to serving folks, when growth becomes the um, everything, it's all about Growth, and you say, "Well, we're 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 bringing people to Jesus," but really, if the agenda is just to grow your church bigger and bigger and bigger, people get lost in the shuffle, and then uh, just the personal life um, that is secretive is one of the biggest um, symbols in, when, a, in the leader. In the leader, and and you you really do. If there's smoke around a leader, you really do need to uh, not assume that. That that's just smoke. You you need to find out and and see what is actually there. And when people say this happened to me or he said this to me, don't just uh, discount that. You, you really like an abuse survivor. You need to listen to that and see if that's true. Because the when you have the mantle of God and power and position, that has an impact in some way. Uh, over the most uh, powerful of people. And when somebody says, this is what Jesus told me in this particular situation we need to do, and they pull that out every time they want people to do what they want them to do. Or there is this smoke of abuse, anger, uh, things that you just don't see in Jesus. Now you see anger in Jesus, but was it over struggle with struggle? No, it was over the religious leaders that he had this kind of anger and was so, so clear in them making the cup on the outside look great and they were filthy inside. So all of that's in there. Uh, you've got the, the toxic leader, but you've also got those that enable and those that perpetrate, those that are actually feeding into it and and believing their mission in life is to keep that person in power. And then you see all of the victims along the way. So it's a it's a pretty clear picture. We see it played out over and over again in many situations. And I I just hope people won't give up on God and just give up on that system or that person or those elders. And there's so many healthy, 
wonderful churches, humble ministers out there. That, that's where we need to go, and, and it may not be the biggest. You know, before I was a teaching pastor at Northview Church, we went to this little church very near here, 100 people in the congregation, and you'll never see that pastor write a book or anything, but we loved being part of that church because it was just so real and authentic. And go find that church if, if you're in one that you really question what's going on at the top. I think it's possible, I was struck by your comment, uh, that this, this mantle of responsibility when mm-hmm. you're a shepherd, when mm-hmm. you're a pastor, when you're the guy at the point in a church dynamic, that there's so much power with that. Do you think it's possible that some pastors, they don't even realize it before it's too late? In other words, they don't realize the impact of their words or direction because they didn't comprehend how serious it was. Yeah. I think um, everybody should take a look at the word intoxication. And for some sex and some alcohol, and I think for everyone, power is intoxicating. And just like some people drink normally and some people don't, some people will feel the intoxication of power and control and position, and they, they just can't get enough of it. And that would be the thing to evaluate. The hunger and thirst grows. Yeah. Is to ask yourself, have I been, have been so intoxicated with this that I've lost people? I've lost my connection and my love. for me. Every time I get up to preach, my wife says, Steve, don't forget, just love those people. It's just, it's so great. Now, um, I would like to say that I would do that even if she didn't say that, but it's, you have to have people. It's a good reminder. Yeah. And, I mean, you actually do. And nobody uh, that's in this toxic role who's intoxicated with power has anybody around them that they've given permission to say, hey, you need to take a second look at this. And anybody that does, well, they're no longer part of the organization. So I, I hope and pray maybe some pastor is listening and might say, you know what, I, I need to do something about this. I actually, um, you know, I do a lot of things. And I did get a taste of that intoxication. And so I have somebody that does everything for me. So I don't have much power in my organization. I manage by consensus. And I let other people who know more on the ground make those big decisions. Now, there are things that, you know, I have to do and I have to decide um, because we have to manage them. Sure, sure. But I got to tell you, I had to make a big choice to back away from that. And I think there are a lot of pastors that need to do the same thing. A few weeks ago, Barna, uh, a research group, uh, released results of a survey and that suggested that 38% of pastors just want to walk out of the ministry. Mm-hmm. You know, there's a certain um, sense of discouragement, perhaps, or the challenge is not worth the price paid. Uh, and of course, the pandemic has changed a lot for yeah. ministry, and there are so many dramas that have erupted during the pandemic uh, on other fronts. How do you hear that, or what do you think about a, t- a statistic like that? 38%, I mean, that's a vast number. Yeah. who are discouraged or want to walk away? Well, if I was talking with one of those 38%, um, I'd ask them if they ever had Chick-fil-A. And they'd probably say yes. And um, I would say, well, you know, um, last week I had a guy from Chick-fil-A in my office, and he was telling me about the question that everybody ought to ask, that Chick-fil-A asked. If you want a franchise, it's easier to get into Harvard Business School than to get a franchise for Chick-fil-A. And they begin with the first question, why do you want to own a franchise? And then they ask you that about a thousand times before you're ever given a franchise. And that answer needs to be evolving. And I would say to those 38%, why did you want to be a pastor? Let's talk about that. What were you expecting? Because a lot of times people see the mega church, the big shot, and they're thinking, that's what I want to do. But that's, that's the exception. And many of them don't do it well. So, yeah, that's why you wanted to. Now, 
Why would you want to do something else? Is it because that didn't happen? Or is it simply because you discovered these aren't my best talents and skills? Great. Don't continue to hurt people with horrible <laughs> sermons and not caring about them. Go find what, what you're meant to do. But for others, maybe the why needs to change. Maybe my expectation needs to be adjusted and then I can fall back in love with serving people and preaching some truth to them that they might understand. That's what I'd say to them. You know, as you were talking, I, I just recalled my own journey. Um, when I was growing up, I had no intention of being in the ministry. And uh, I was, see, Steve, I'm at a table with you and I, you, you just, I'm, just, I'm becoming your, your, your patient, your client. 75 bucks. <laughs> so, I mean, I'll pay it, I'll pay it. Yeah. But I mean, just looking back at my old life, I, I was a wallflower. I didn't want to be noticed. I was, you know, blend into the wallpaper was my, my game because I was afraid if people noticed me, they'd make fun of me. But deep down inside of me, uh, that's because I was pretty geeky and nerdy and so on. <laughs> and with good reason, they would have made fun of me. But deep down inside of me, I saw, my, I saw myself up front, uh, in front of a crowd or, or leading. And uh, that became pretty clear to me when I was 14. And I, I dreamed of politics. It seemed to me that, well, that's what mm. you know, politicians are what yeah. experience that. So anyway, I, I kind of played with that in my head. And I went to law school for the purpose of going into government, not because I wanted to practice law and so on. I dreamed of being the president of the United States. I just thought that would be the you know, that would be the, the greatest uh, outcome and the most yeah. amazing stage. Mm. And, of course, I, I joke with people now. I look back on it, and I think that's so ridiculous. How could I think of such a thing? And then I look at the people who have been president, and I think, well, maybe yeah. I, I, I could have <laughs> I could have competed in that crowd. But uh, that all said, I the Lord steered me differently. I, I, I had a brief taste of politics in a small way in the legislature of my home state in Washington, but I've, I landed the ministry. Now, years on, here I am. And my job as a pastor and now in this present role where I, I kind of pastor many churches yeah. in a, of a kind, it's so taxing sometimes and it's so frustrating and it's so stretching. And I think back to your question. It's like the Lord says to me, well, what did you think? You wanted to be president of the United States. That's, this is what this is like. Because if you want to actually influence people, there's always going to be some trouble. Yeah. There's going to be some rub, but there's going to be some challenge, and you have to decide, is this uh, what what you're really called to be? And so all, all that extra version I just did with you, Steve, I just want to thank you for helping me sort that mm -hmm. out once more, and I'm, gonna, I'm not going to quit today. Well, you know, while you were saying that, I was thinking that people that are really called to ministry uh, need to be ready also for some major, major challenge personally and and struggle you know uh four weeks ago i filled in for uh, rick warren at saddleback and i used to do that regularly when i lived out there he would get sick and ask me to just he'd call me on a saturday one time he called and said i'm not sick but my computer has a virus and i can't pull up my sermon could you <laughs> preach i said yes i'll be there but you know his uh he has a an allergy to adrenaline and if you look at his uh, pulpit there is a bowl of cool water and a fan that he has to cool himself down the, the whole time. His uh, health has been such a struggle. His son committed suicide. And and many times I think we, we don't say it out loud or believe it out loud, but down inside we're thinking, if I'm called and I go this direction, God's just going to pave the way. I think we need to be realistic. We're going to have some really tough things when God causes because Satan does not like us doing well in God's work. He wants to destroy it. So that would be um, another thing for people to, to realize that there is going to be this struggle. And, and a lot of people are never going to understand that until they've walked the, the path of a pastor or a leader. And you really, really have to have other people around you if you're going to continue to lead for a long time. We had... Uh a guest speaker at one of our events uh, that was the daughter of Billy Graham. And uh, she had a little slideshow of what it was like growing up in the Billy Graham house. Mm. She had five kids, as you know, and she was one of those. And one of the finales of her, of her presentation, because she had all kinds of anecdotes about what it was yeah. like and fun things and hilarious things and challenging things and so on. 
But at the end, she had this photograph of her father, uh, then still living, uh, seated in a chair, and this whole crowd of his children and their spouses and the grandchildren, I think there were like 65 or Mm -hmm. 70 people in this picture, and it's picture perfect, sunny day in the uh, Blue Ridge Mountains where they live and all that. And so she's got that up there as kind of like the end slide. And and of course, I'm watching it and I'm thinking, whoa, what a great close, what a happy ending. And then she says, I'm not pointing them out to you, but in that crowd, and she's just started to call out some of the challenges. She said, my father, uh, for all of the you know, stellar reviews he received in his lifetime about uh, the circumspection of his life and his integrity and so on and so forth, my father carries deeply the heartaches and the broken places in this picture. Mm-hmm. And it's to your point that you can't, no matter where we are in life, if you're doing good, there's going to be some things that will just tear your heart out and you keep going. That's right. Well, one of the joys of my life is I get Christmas cards, just like what you described. And those Christmas cards are from men that went to our Every Man's Battle workshop, or they're for women uh, that they went to our intimacy and marriage intensive. And and our things are different. You hear someone speak and then you go into a group with a, a clinician and you do group work and then you hear something else. And these notes say, well, here's the picture that you've kept together. This wouldn't, this wouldn't be possible it, because yeah. half of them would be over with me one day and the other half there, or I'd be in the apartment and maybe they'd let me come. But this picture is a result of the hope we got to experience. And, and I love that. I Absolutely. love that. I have a, a story of Ruth Graham, his daughter, was divorced a third time. And she, an abusive guy, and she said, I drove up. Dad knew I was coming. And she said, I didn't know what, what was going to happen. And she said, there he was, the end of the driveway. And the first thing he said did he hurt you? That's all he cared about. Well, had she been hurt? No shame, just love and forgiveness. And I love hearing that about him in his private life. That you know, there was no, he was not uh, anything but a, a good man to them. He he might have not been around as much as he could have. He says that himself. Yes, sure. But when they needed his, they grace, knew he and loved love. him. That's they, right. That he loved them. That's right. He did. They all knew that. You mentioned every man's battle or retreat. Mm-hmm. Tell me about that. What, what, what's its purpose? Mm-hmm. And yeah. unpack it. Well, it's not a retreat. It's you come in on Friday and you leave Sunday. And in that time, a lot of a lot of people, a lot of the men hate being there on Friday. They're there just because she said either go or we're done. And that's and it's like a hotel or you're at a hotel, you know. and and we're and so you hear. Uh, a presenter talk about a concept. Well, the first thing he talks about is his own life and his own recovery and how things have changed. And and then you go to work. And in that group, not only, I mean, it's not like going to see a therapist, but you've got a therapist and you've got these other men that may be in the same place as you, but you've also got alumni who maybe have been 20 years without looking at any image other than their wife and they, it it just changes everything. I mean, you go from being this shameful little boy with an angry mother to walking out of there with brothers encouraging you to be the man that God called you to be. And then that's just the beginning. You get involved in support group and Bible studies and, and it just changes everything. And that's why we're still doing it 25 years later when, uh, you know, that's when every man's battle came out. We have a second edition that we did where we corrected some of the insensitivities that we had in the first edition. But the main thing is that you go to work when you come to our workshop. And if you don't want to be there, we help you work with that and why you need to be there. Because, you know, in our world, um, so often in the Christian world, sex is for men. Gratification is for men. Women are for men, and many of these images and practices come out of a pornified world where the woman is just there for the gratification of the man. And you totally miss 
this amazing experience of oneness and intimacy that needs to be there, I think, when, when sex is truly fulfilling uh, for both people. And Jim, I can tell you, my wife, if she was here, and she, she's tough, but she would tell you we're having the best years of our life and the, more, the best intimacy of our life, that it can continue to get better. And it wasn't always that way. And in fact, you know, I had to, she found a website where you could go and learn how to be better sexually. This physician couple talked about things mom and dad didn't teach you. And so we share some of that in our intimacy workshop. But I had to be willing to admit, yeah, I don't, I don't do this too well. <laughs> I'd done it a well, lot. There's, there's, but a I don't do it well. there's a one to yeah. grow. Yeah. And, and so um, to see the kinds of things happen, of these men transforming and starting to see women as women, not body parts, or as these fascinating human beings at the same level of them, rather than these objectified, uh, inferior objects here. Yeah, subordinates uh, compared to what they see in movies or, or in pornography. It, it really is an amazing, amazing uh, transformation. And our, our best supporters are people that have come out of either Every Man's Battle or what we do for the women is a workshop called Restore. And they, they're they so grateful to get out of that bad little boy, angry mother. You know, if if you're an angry mother, you probably don't want to have sex with a bad little boy, you know, if you're healthy. So we get him to rise up and be the man and her to not be the angry mother, but to be the wife and partner. And, you know, we, one of the things that we like to help people understand is when people hear this word submission, a woman hears doormat. And I think if you accurately um, interpret that, it's more like women partner with this guy, not be a doormat to this guy. And when he is said to be a, a leader, it's not dictator. It is a wonderful partnership in leadership. And that's what Fred and I wrote about in Every Man's Marriage is mutual submission. Because as you know, the Bible says, submit yourselves one to another. It's like about, got about 40 words on submission, about 100 <laughs> words on dying to yourself as a man to have oneness in that relationship. And I got to tell you, given the choice between submission and dying to yourself, I think submission is it's but, a better win. But we don't hear a lot about that. But I just think they come to see that some of the teaching that they've heard about you have these rights and all this kind of stuff, um, and 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 a lot of times they'll say, "Well, she withheld sex from me," and I, I go, "And so what did you do?" Well, I showed her in the Bible that you know she just shouldn't do that, and I'll say, <laughs> "Hey, buddy, if all you've got is a verse." <laughs> that's it. That's how you you need help here. And that's the whole point. It's it's not that we believe withholding sex is good. It's not, but it's an indication. We've got to do some it's work. It's a symptom. Together. Yeah, it's a symptom. And when you say every man's battle, I mean, for someone who may not be familiar with a book, it, it's a it's about wrestling with your own sexuality. Yeah, and, and and managing it and polishing it and and living into the best part of it. Why are you compensating? with this obsession with lust rather than desire for your wife to be leading the, the, the day. And a lot of men never ask that question. So it's tragic that they're living the counterfeit. They're like uh, wax museum people. <laughs> well, but that, that all is a, is a men's focused uh, ministry, but yeah. you're also focused on women Right, and that's the restore program, and and your writing and your your offerings through New Life Live and all of that uh, have specific tracks for women too. Because oh, definitely, and you know, we we created, uh, or I mean, I had the the vision for women of faith, and that had uh, that had one agenda: encourage women. You know, men were going to promise keepers trying to keep their promises. Women were back home keeping their promises. And so I just wanted to encourage them. And But right now, uh, New Life is in a partnership with Museum of the Bible, and we are creating with the Greens a truth movement, and we're starting with women. And so we're creating an experience that will happen November the 4th at Museum of the Bible. 
and um, it it turns the museum into a, a true, unforgettable interactive experience versus just a place where they've got old stuff. And that will be the beginning of more things we're doing for women. The agenda isn't to encourage women, but the agenda is to get women excited about truth, transformation, and to infect their world with truth and not let secular society take over or, or well, they already have kind of taken over, but to take it back. I just have to ask you about uh, the phenomenon in our country now. There's so much talk about mental health. Mm -hmm. It's a crisis. Yeah. So we hear uh, a lot of things that are 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 seen in the headlines as broken places often go to mental health. I mean, if we see a headline about a shooting, it, sometimes it's maybe rationalized or explained yeah. through a mental health lens yeah. if there's a crime committed otherwise. Or or maybe there's just an economic dislocation of those people who live outside. It's probably a mental health issue or whatever. How do you see that? Do you think there really is a mental health crisis in our time? Is it just that we're using that as a, as a, a blanket term or... Are we living in an age where mental health needs to move to the front and center of our thinking? Well, there's definitely a mental health problem. We, we see the symptoms of that all the time. The problem is people don't see that the solution is a spiritual treatment and a spiritual, we are spiritual beings. So you might see physical symptoms, you might see mental uh, symptoms. But both of those are going to be impacted by the spiritual life. A Harvard study, it's just bizarre that this came out of Harvard, just released about four weeks ago, talked about the difference between people that go to church every week and the people that don't. And they studied 70,000 healthcare workers over 16 years. And they said this, it's not spirituality, it's not some strange religion thing. But those that went to these Christian churches every week were 33% more likely to be alive at the end of the study than those that did not go every week. Now, what, do we, what can we draw? If somebody goes to church every week, you know, that is a pretty good sign that they are very dedicated, dedicated and committed believers. And so when you hear all the crummy stuff about crummy churches, there are some really healthy churches. I mean... Uh, the likelihood of divorce is cut in half by people that go to church every week. They're regular, you call regular attenders. That, to me, is just a reinforcement of what we're doing. We're not saying the solution comes out of five ways to rethink your past. It comes out of relationship with the God that created you through his son. And not just that, but a growth program that he intends for you. Living uh, in such a way that you see some fruits of this supernatural Holy Spirit within you. That you, you, you see some joy come out, some self-control, some actual results here. So I do think we have a huge mental health problem. And I don't think there are a lot of people in charge that see how valuable uh, the spiritual aspect of that being healed uh, is. And if and until we do, we're just going to be, you know, always struggling with massive drug addiction and homelessness and mental illness and stuff. But we do have a solution, and, and we're not foolish to think that this is a big part of why people get better is because they surrender to God. Would you say there's a, there's a, a mental illness? I mean, there's a... There's a f physiological phenomenon that requires well, medication. Yeah, or when we talk about mental illness uh, versus a mental health problem, uh, mental illness sometimes, or many times is endogenous and you're not going to think your way out of it. Um, you know, just like me being on antidepressant, I didn't mention this, but my mother's father committed suicide. He was so depressed, he killed himself. My mother found him. He had shot himself in the head. Uh, in our family is this strain of mental illness. And so I had a predisposition to that. Um, a person that's schizophrenic, the bad news is um, you're, you're not going to convert to Jesus and that go away. 
But the good news is the medication now is so helpful if you find the right medication that you can live a pretty normal life uh, if you're schizophrenic. So those kinds of things uh, have treatment. We need to get people uh, to that treatment. But the overall mental health, COVID has destroyed the mental health of our kids. I mean, it's, and uh, just like the study the other day that came out about Instagram has destroyed the mental health of young girls, teen girls. How so? How so? Well, because they see uh, these girls that are doing these videos that look like they live in better houses, have better bodies. It's all perfection. Right. And, and, and they spend their time doing that versus connecting and growing and and so, and the messages uh, from Instagram essentially is you're on your own. There, there's no ultimate truth. Mom and dad are old fashioned. They don't know what they're talking about. And so they get pretty lost not having some kind of foundation to base their life on. So we've got a, we've got a way to help folks. Um, but they have to be willing to get that kind of help. And the world isn't out there saying, hey, come on, let's, let's uh, look at Jesus here. Let's look, look at God. But that study out of Harvard was so clear about it was church attendance that had such a huge impact on people's lives. Do you ever get afraid, Steve? Is there, is there something in, that you have to face? Maybe it's walking out on a stage or... or a person that you have to meet up. I mean, do you, do you ever experience the sense of like, oh my goodness, I don't have it. I don't, I don't have what it takes to make this. Hmm. Well, I've never had what it took. I mean, really, I, I haven't. I, I've always felt like, you know, God wanted to show me that he could use the most unlikely people. Uh, I may have told you this story, but before Women of Faith, the year before, I toured uh, speakers men in nine cities, and in all nine cities, you add up all the people that came, it was less than a 1,000 people. In Chicago, we had the biggest ballroom ever, and I had 35 people show up. So I was a failure at that. But in the midst of the failure, I had this vision for Women of Faith. And the next year, Women of Faith started, 35,000 came. And the next year, 150,000. And then from then on, it was always over 300 to 400,000 women filling these arenas. So I guess I never felt like I had that. If you look at the best-selling Bibles, December list on the, the Evangelical Christian Publication Association, there are five Bibles in the best-selling Bible category. Three of them are large print or giant print Bibles, just regular <laughs> Bible. Two of them are my Bibles. One is Life Recovery, and the other is... Uh, every man's Bible. Now, <laughs> that is just another example of God using the most unlikely pe person to have two Bibles in the top five. I mean, they're the only study Bibles in the top five best-selling Bibles. So I've never really felt like, outside of God, that I had it. So one day, uh, if I feel like I'm in the wrong place, I, I think I would more think, I don't think God wants me to do this anymore. You know, I'm still on radio, but if I wake up one day and my voice sounds like I'm 100 years old, I don't think I need to do that anymore. So I don't really fear it. I think I'm aware that I'm living on borrowed time and talent anyway. The thing, quite frankly, that I always, uh, probably my biggest fear is fear of abandonment because I've been abandoned. You know, my previous wife was unfaithful and stuff. And so that's always been a a inner, deep inner fear of just, you know, not being wanted or left behind. Um, so you ask me about, well, well, do I ever fear anything? That's it. <clears throat> you, you should go down that adoption trip like I did. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, right. I mean, there's some yeah. of that in there. Yeah. But I, I guess the question came to my mind as you were talking because you have done so many things well, Steve, truly you have. You have a certain confidence about you that is matched by your sense of, Self-aware humility, it seems to me, and it's a perfect, perfect is a strong word, but it, insofar as I could see, it's a perfect complement each to the other. And it's grounded in your faith that there is a God who knows you by name mm. and who has right. things for you to do, 
And that has led you to this thing that has been kind of a thread through this whole conversation, that life matters and that life can be better. Mm -hmm. And when you, when you are in the mix with God and, and when Jesus becomes a part of that exploration of life, it has the chance to really be better. Absolutely. And that's your whole story, yeah. it seems to me. It is. It and I'm is. so proud to know you and call you a friend. Mm, same here. Same here. Thanks for having me up. It's uh, in addition to my CPAP machine, it's great to see you and <laughs> just, see you. I'm just telling you, like I said at the beginning, I always uh, have a smile and feel more hopeful, better after being with you than before I got to see you. Thanks so much. Yeah, you're welcome. For more information, visit allthattosay.org. Thank you for joining the conversation. Don't forget to like and subscribe.